Hello, it's good to be here. I just want you guys to know how dedicated I am to this and to you. I took a red eye from Victoria, BC last night. So I'm running on pure adrenaline and excitement, but it's worth it to be here with you guys. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on who I am and what I do and why I'm here. Um, like my bio said, I got involved in the pro-life movement when I was pretty young. I grew up in a Christian home in a small town. I was always pro-life. I knew that I was pro-life because it was a conversation that we had in our home. Um, we would help with the local pregnancy center banquets. I was one of the kids that would walk around with pitchers of water, refilling glasses. So I was involved, but very minimally. I wasn't really doing anything in the pro-life movement. To be fair, I was 16, um, but it wasn't until I saw a article on my Facebook page titled, What to Get a Friend Post-Abortion. And it was essentially 10 gag gifts to give your friend. And keep in mind, this was published by Teen Vogue, a fashion magazine. And so my first thought was, why are they even talking about abortion at all, let alone speaking about abortion in this manner? I was homeschooled and I did speech and debate, so I was one of those homeschoolers. Um, and I used all of those skills and I sat down, I wrote a script and I filmed this video in response to this Teen Vogue article. And we reached out to Students for Life of America. I was kind of involved in the local club that was on a community college near me. But we reached out, asked if they wanted to share the video, and I had very little expectations for where this was going to go. Keep in mind, I wasn't really doing anything in the pro-life movement before this. I remember when they posted the video, um, I checked into their Facebook, and I scrolled down, and I, I saw the caption that they used for my video, and it was, this is Autumn. She is Planned Parenthood's worst nightmare. And I remember thinking, am I? I honestly had no idea. I was like, okay, interesting. I guess I'll, I'll go with it. Here's where I'm at. And so I partnered with Students for Life of America. And I interned for them with, for a couple of years. I was still in school. Um, and then I ended up slowly becoming a full-time employee with Students for Life. And that is what I do full-time. But it wasn't without roadblocks. I'm sure, as you know, being involved in the pro-life movement is not easy. It's exhausting. It's heartbreaking. At times, it feels like an uphill battle. And in the very beginning, I remember feeling incredibly overwhelmed because I was terrified that people would realize I was absolutely nobody special. I was a 16-year-old girl who grew up in somewhat of a bubble. My Christian community, I wasn't really exposed to that much of the outside world. And when I became in the national spotlight overnight, I was absolutely terrified. I was being attacked for everything. My education, my faith, my intelligence, my appearance, you name it. I was being attacked at 16 years old. And I can tell you it is a very unfamiliar and uncomfortable feeling to read thousands of comments from strangers about you, people who have no idea who you are, what your background is, or really what you believe. I didn't really like it, honestly. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm surrounded by people like Abby Johnson, who was a former Planned Parenthood director who left the industry and now works to get others out of the abortion industry. People like David Delighton, who went undercover to expose the fetal harvesting industry of Planned Parenthood. People like Kristen Hawkins, a mom and the leader of Students for Life of America. And then there was me, just a girl who cared. And for a while I struggled with that because I thought I don't have an important testimony or a radical story to share, a reason why I am here and why I am doing this work. And then I realized that's enough because I can stand here in front of you today and say that if I can do it, you can do it. It is not because there is something special or unique about my life that allowed me to enter into the pro-life movement. It was because I decided to spend my time and my energy advocating for those who have no voice. It's difficult, it's overwhelming, but it is incredibly important and you have a place in this movement. And in my five years of, of pro-life activism, I've learned a couple of things and I wanted to share two of those with you today. And the first is that anyone can make a difference. I'm amazed every single day that this is what I get to do. I'm truly honored to even be here with you today, and like I said, I don't have a radical testimony to share with you. 
I am just a pro-life activist because when I was 16, I decided to make it a priority in my life and I filmed one video. I decided to fight every single day for the most vulnerable in our society. Today, we are not here to make a case for why abortion is wrong. We know that abortion is wrong. The question is what part do we play in this movement? You are a vital piece of this fight. You will make a difference. You have a unique part to play. You are the pro-life generation. And as we know, this is the most pro-life generation we have ever seen. And I believe with all my heart that this will be the generation to end abortion. We will see the end of abortion in our lifetime. We will fight every single day to continue to work towards that goal. And so today, if you have ever felt held back, like you don't really have what it takes to truly make a difference, I'm asking you to let go of that. And in order to do that, I want you to think about who you are fighting for. A few years ago, in my pro-life activism, I started to hit a roadblock. I started to feel frustrated. I started to feel like I wasn't really seeing a change as fast as I wanted to see it. I'm sure you know, if you've been in the pro-life movement, that momentum can be hard to hold on to when it feels like, how could we ever really end abortion? And it was right around my 18th birthday, I started to get preoccupied, I started to become a little bit apathetic, frustrated, and focusing on other things. And then the movie Gosnell came out. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen that, but it's a story about Kermit Gosnell, who was an abortionist in Pennsylvania in the mid-2000s. And he was running a clinic, performing abortions far past the legal age. And at a rate so fast he wasn't even able to discard the babies fast enough. They originally invaded his clinic because of illegal prescription writing, but when they found what was going on, they realized it was much bigger. They found milk jugs full of little baby feet because he had nowhere else to put the limbs that he was tearing apart. It was absolutely horrific. And yet, when he put in trial, he started to win. Because they didn't want to make it a case about abortion, right? They wanted to focus on, on the illegal prescriptions, a slap on the wrist, maybe brush it under the rug. They didn't want to open that conversation to whether or not what he was doing was really wrong. Because otherwise they may have had to have addressed whether or not abortion was wrong. And they didn't want to go down that road. And so as the trial progressed, there was absolutely no media coverage. It was very clearly being brushed under the rug and he looked like he was going to win this case. That was until one of his victims was shared in court. It was a photo of a little boy that he had aborted full term, clipped his neck, threw him on a shelf to die. That little boy was labeled baby boy A in the trial, and that photo single-handedly changed the case. Because of that photo, Kermit Gosnell is now where he belongs, life in prison. Because they were able to see the humanity of what was happening, they were able to see the victims of Kermit Gosnell, they could not help but understand and know that what he was doing was wrong. And after I saw that video, I was hit with conviction. I realized that I had become apathetic. I had become so involved in the pro-life movement, I started to get desensitized to what is happening. And that is absolutely the worst thing that can happen to us. We cannot forget what abortion is. We cannot forget the horrific reality of abortion. And we must use that as motivation to continue on. And so the next day, I marched into a tattoo parlor and I got a little A on my wrist for baby boy A to remind myself every single day of why I do what I do. And when I'm doing dishes, when I'm folding laundry, and the day I walked down my wedding aisle, I looked down and was reminded of why I fight this fight. I am fighting for baby boy A and every other child that has unjustly been taken away from this world in the name of reproductive rights. I am fighting for young women who feel like abortion is their only option. I am fighting for the fathers who had no say in whether or not their child lived or died. 
I am fighting for the millions of children who die from abortion every single year. Who are you fighting for? It does not matter who you are. Somebody needs you to fight for them. The second thing that I've learned in my pro-life activism is that life will always triumph over death. Life will always triumph over death. The United States just overturned a ruling that sat in place for nearly 50 years. And for years, people mocked us for saying that we would be the first post-road generation. When we started using that term, people didn't even understood what that meant. Because for many, they could not imagine Roe v. Wade ever moving. They never thought that that day would come. And yet, on June 24th, 2022, that is what we became, the first post-Roe generation. But it was not by osmosis. When Roe v. Wade was put into place in 1973, pro-life activists got to work immediately. They fought every single day, refusing to give up. They did not know the time or day it would come, but they knew that life would win. The only reason I got to celebrate the overturning of Roe v. Wade was because of the pro-life activists before me, the ones who refused to give up, the ones who refused to become apathetic, the ones who continued to carry the torch. And as the pro-life generation, that is now our job to take that torch and run as fast and as far as we can to ensure that women, children, and families are protected. Life will win, but we must be vigilant and prepared to combat the pro-abortion message. The pro-abortion industry always has the same strategy. When they want to make abortion legal and normalized, they know they can't come out the gate with what they really want. It has to be incremental, manipulative, slow. It starts with, well, we want abortion for medical emergencies. We need that. And once they get that, it moves to, well, we want abortion to be safe, legal, and rare. And that becomes, we want abortion to be safe and legal. And as we know very well, even that becomes, we want abortion. Because there's nothing safe about abortion, and with the rise of chemical abortion, we're seeing every single day that the abortion industry continues to put profit over people. If they were really concerned about women's health, they would not be shipping deadly chemical abortion pills all over the world, putting them in the hands of abusers, putting them in the hands of, of women who have un unknown ectopic pregnancies, Chemical abortions are dangerous and deadly for women, and yet the abortion industry does not talk about that because their priority has always been abortion, and it always will be. They are more concerned with access and expansion of abortion than the protection of women. Abortion advocates want you to play the defense, so play the offense. There will be challenges that we will face. Fear, backlash, misinformation, hatred. They think that if they can scare you, they can silence you. That is their goal. If you've ever been confused as to why every time you open your mouth about abortion on social media, you're attacked. And it's because they think if they can put enough pressure, if they can make you feel uncomfortable enough, then maybe you'll just shut up and go away because the reality is deep down, they know that they are not able to dismantle what you are saying. We have truth on our science side. We have science on our side. We know what we believe and why we believe it and how to defend it, and the other side does not have that. They don't. And so, we need to envision the win. We need to utilize our tools to walk forward. We are winning, they know it, and we must utilize tools to maintain a pro-life culture. Some of those being, we need to envision our win. We need to fight with passion and confidence. Too often, those in the pro-life movement remind me of a football coach. Moments before his team takes the field, telling him that even though he has prepared them for this day, 
they will not be victorious. Can you imagine what would happen on that field during that game? Do you think that they would win? Absolutely not, because the person who prepared them told them that it wasn't going to happen. It's basic sports psychology. Always envision the win. We must control the narrative, and largely that's through pro-life apologetics. All of these pro-choice arguments have clear, logical, and simple answers. Every single argument has an answer, and I promise you, when you know that, when you know how to utilize it, when you know how to have that conversation, the fear will melt away. The only difference between me now and me the year before I got involved in the pro-life movement is the knowledge and understanding I have of these arguments. I can go onto a college campus, I can talk with people on social media, people can ask me questions, and I know that I will be able to answer their questions. And not just for the sake of, of winning a debate, but hopefully providing truth and information that they seem to be seeking for. We must be relentless and refuse apathy. The worst thing that could happen to us is that we become apathetic. When we become apathetic, that is when we start to lose, when we forget why we are fighting, when we lose sight of the importance of this issue. We must be heard and be loud, and we must believe that we can make a change. I think sometimes the reason this, this movement is so overwhelming is because we view those on the opposition as just that, those who oppose us. Pro-choice people are pro-choice and they always will be, right? The reality is, every single day, minds are being changed. Lives are being changed. We have the ability to share truth and love, to have these conversations and truly change people's minds. I want you to imagine, if you were to meet somebody who is pro-choice and right off the bat, they told you, hey, I am 100% pro-choice. There's absolutely nothing you can say to change my mind. I don't even really want to listen to you because I am so set in my beliefs. Versus if you met somebody who said, hey, I, I consider myself pro-choice. I have questions. Maybe I don't fully know where I stand on the issue, but I'd love to talk to you to hear your perspective. You would probably go into those two conversations very differently. But the only difference between those is your perspective going in, how you view that person, the roadblock you have put in front of you before you even understand where they are. I think we view pro-choice people as unable to change their minds. They are angry. They hate me. We are going to be on opposite sides forever. The reality is there is a lot more common ground than we think. And when we have the ability to look them in the eye, to treat them like a human being with respect, even though they absolutely disagree with us, that is when we see change in this movement. When we have those one-on-one -on -one conversations, the difficult conversations with family members, friends, cousins, classmates, you name it. It feels overwhelming and scary, but I think the reason is because of how we view these people. A while back on my Instagram, I asked my followers if anyone who was previously pro-choice who became pro-life would be willing to share what changed their mind. And I got hundreds of responses, and so I wanted to share just a couple with you. And these are reasons that people who were pro-choice became pro-life. And I think that it's important for us to, to know this, to have this information, so that we can see how we can best communicate with these people who are on opposite ends with us. All right, here's a couple. The first is somebody said, I actually started researching the science. That'll do it. It's a good place to start. Somebody said, getting pregnant with my first baby and knowing instantly that they were a person who matters. Somebody said, giving my life to the Lord. Another person said, I was asked, when does human life have rights? And then it was followed up with, why then? And I think this is an incredible question because it doesn't immediately put somebody on defense. You're simply asking, where do you think we should draw the line? of when human rights begin. And they get to answer with their own opinion. 
and then you get to ask follow-up questions. And what you'll very quickly realize is it's an incredibly slippery slope. Without the scientific stance that life begins at conception, everything else is arbitrary because it's not consistent with anything else. For example, if somebody were to tell you, well, I believe that abortion is okay all the way up until birth. You're not a human being and you don't have rights until you take your first breath. You ask the question, what is the difference between a child five minutes out of the womb and five minutes before they come out of the womb? Nothing. Okay, what's the difference between a baby five minutes before they're born and, and two weeks? Not much. Maybe a little bit bigger, a little bit chubbier, maybe they have a little bit more hair. Okay, what's the difference between a baby earlier and earlier? And maybe they'll say, well, well, viability, right? I think it's viability. Abortion is wrong after a baby is viable. But this is not when life begins. And you can use this example. If somebody who were 30 years old, we would all agree, is a full living human being with human rights, was in a horrific car accident and put on life support, they're not viable. They're not able to sustain their own life. If they're in a hospital put on life support, they're not considered completely viable. If you were to leave them alone, they most likely wouldn't survive, which proves that we don't really believe that life begins when you are viable or that it ends when you are not. That's not when human life begins. We're able to look at science that says life begins at conception. 97% of scientists say that life begins at conception. And that's a study out of the University of Chicago, which is a very non-biased, or not at least in our favor, place. And you can also, if you ever are in a conversation with somebody who's pro-choice and they argue with you about this, that life doesn't begin at conception. That's a religious view. You don't, you don't know what you're talking about. That didn't come from any scientific stance. You can type one thing into Google. When does life begin, question mark, Princeton EDU? And Princeton EDU will pull up an entire article with resources, with textbooks expert, excerpts that say life begins at fertilization, life begins at conception, and that's Princeton EDU. So they can argue with you, but they probably would have a harder time arguing with Princeton EDU. And so it's important for us to know where these resources are, to be able to point where we're getting our information because it's not going to be reciprocated on the other side. Another person said that the reason I became pro-life is because the pro-lifers who were in my life never shamed me when I was pro-choice, so we had great conversations about it. My friend invited me to a pro-life march. I had no idea what pro-lifers were really like. Somebody else said, I became pro-life when I find, found out what actually happens in an abortion. I considered myself lukewarm pro-choice. Another person said something very similar, saying, listening to a doctor describe what actually happens in abortion. And I find it interesting that almost every single person who shared a similar experience used the word actually. And why do you think that is? Most likely because they had heard what happened during an abortion from somebody who is pro-choice, or maybe even from Planned Parenthood themselves in an abortion facility. But the word actually shows that what they had previously heard was nowhere near reality, that there was a lot of missing information. Because when you go to an abortion facility, what they'll say is, it's a clump of cells that will be removed. It's not a human being. It doesn't have, you know, arms and legs like those crazy pro-lifers tell you. It's just a little blob. Um, it's kind of like scraping your hand and dead skin cells falling off. It's pretty much the equivalent because it's just some cells. That's an incredibly anti-science view and stance. And so I find it interesting that many people, when they actually found out what happens to an in an abortion, that is what made them become pro-life. Watching the videos of the abortion procedures, it's horrific, but I think that it is a wake-up call that a lot of people need. If we don't truly understand how horrific abortion is, how can we be passionately against it? We have to educate ourselves and be aware of what is happening behind the closed doors of these abortion facilities and use that as motivation to speak up for those people. 
Another one said that I'm a guy, so I was under the impression that it was not my issue to fight for. That was until I learned more. And you know what? I think this is one of the most damaging arguments from the pro-choice side. And here's why. Not only is it absolutely ridiculous that men are not allowed to have a say in whether or not it is wrong to violently end the life of an innocent human being. Not only is that ridiculous, but here's what else this argument does. It enables men to walk out on women. Because the argument, your body, your choice, turns into your body, your problem, I'm out. I might drive you to the abortion facility because I'm a great guy, but other than that, you're on your own. How can we claim to be pro-woman and yet use an argument that enables men to walk out on women? Because we all know that many women don't want abortion. They find themselves in an instance where they feel like they can't get themselves out of. They didn't expect to be there. And when their significant other walks out the door, it becomes a lot scarier of a situation. And so, to all the men in the room, I'm not only giving you permission to speak up. If the radical pro-abortion women are telling you you don't have a voice, I'm telling you you do. I'm a woman, so I can, I can give you that freedom. But I also want you to know that not only do you have permission to speak up, we desperately need your voice. We need your strength, we need your confidence, we need your boldness to protect women and to protect children. They know that they have to try to silence you with an idiotic argument like no uterus, no opinion. Because if we were to come together as a community, men and women and families, to unite against the evil of abortion, it would be a lot stronger force. So thank you to all of the men who are here today. Your voice is absolutely important. It matters. You will make a difference, and we need your voice. A couple of the other responses I got from people were things like science. That was it. That was the whole response. It was just science, period. Becoming a mother. I was 20 years old. Everyone told me to abort. My baby is now 10 years old. I realized that it adds trauma to an already horrific circumstance. And the last one was I had to heal from my abortion in the past. Here is what almost all of those show me. Truth and love changes everything. Sometimes when people make a bad decision, they think that the guilt will go away if they get people to agree and validate them. Which is why we see those who are in the pro-choice movement, it seems almost more of a defensiveness than anything. And I think the reality is that in a lot of those cases, that is because they are hurting. Post-abortive women are hurting. And in a pro-choice movement that tells them that abortion is no big deal, that it's absolutely fine, and if anyone has bad feelings about it, that's going to make us look bad. It is harming women. It's making them feel alone. It's making them feel hurt. Because they don't get to have real feelings. They have to shove it down and pretend that abortion is fine, and I don't regret my abortion, and I feel totally fine, and my life went back to where I wanted it. The reality is that abortion hurts women, and for many of them, it is a decision they regret for the rest of their lives. And these women, more than anything, need healing. They need truth and love. That has to be our approach. Abortion will not solve your problems, but I'm here to walk alongside you. Your child's life matters, and so does yours. You don't have to sacrifice the life of your child for your education. You can do both, and I will help you. Abortion is wrong, but there is healing for post-abortive women, men, and families. There is truth on our side. This fight is not just about protecting preborn lives. It's about protecting women. It's about protecting men. It's about protecting families. And you may not even know the full extent to the impact you could have to those around you. I wanted to share a story from, this was, I guess now a couple of years ago. It feels 
like not that long, but my mom is very involved in praying outside of the local abortion facility in our community. She runs a sidewalk advocates group and she does 40 days for life, so she's out there quite a bit, but it's very difficult to stand there, to take time out of your day to go stand on a sidewalk knowing very well that you will probably be harassed, yelled at, flipped off, screamed at, you name it. And there was one particular day where she really didn't want to go. She was honestly just exhausted. She had children to homeschool, and she didn't want to go. But she said, I'm just going to do it for one hour. I'm just going to drive there. I'm going to bring my sign. I'm going to pray. I'm going to have my little bags with information about alternative resources for one hour. And when she was there, she walked past a woman who was clearly very pregnant and looked like she needed help. She was walking out of the Planned Parenthood in our community. And my mom stopped her to ask her if she needed anything, and they didn't speak the same language, but my mom caught on pretty quickly that this woman did need help. My mom later found out that Angie was a Colombian refugee. She had escaped into Texas, and they shipped her over the border into Canada, and they put her right over the border into Bellingham, Washington, in a homeless base camp. Her husband was deported, and she was eight months pregnant, completely alone. She went to Planned Parenthood because she thought that they would be able to help her, but of course, since she didn't want an abortion, they had nothing to offer her. So they sent her out the doors and down the sidewalk, and that's when she ran into my mom. I remember the day I was standing in my kitchen, I think I was making cookies with my niece, and my mom calls me, so I kind of have it up in my ear, and my mom calls me like 12 times a day sometimes, so I'm just like, okay, yeah, what is it? And she was like, okay, um, so don't tell dad, but I'm bringing um, a Colombian refugee home, and I don't know where she's going to stay or what we're going to do, but we have to help her. And I remember thinking, okay, yeah, that sounds like you. I'm not surprised at all. And so within a couple of hours, we were able to connect her with the Pregnancy Resource Center down the street. We walked her right over there. They got her a few things she needed, like prenatals and um, some information that she needed. She got an ultrasound just to check on the baby. And we found a Spanish church that allowed her to stay in their basement for four nights. And so I remember coming over with a bag of groceries and an air mattress, meeting this woman in the basement of this random church. And again, we still didn't really know what the next step was. But my mom, as determined as she is, knew that we would figure it out. And within a few days, we were able to get her a slot at a local maternity home where she was able to stay for several months as she gave birth to her baby and got her back on her feet. We ended up being able to host a baby shower for Angie. And I have a few photos here that'll pop up on the slide. This is me and Angie at her baby shower. She's, I think, a few weeks from popping out that baby. Um, but the local Spanish church connected with us. We threw her a surprise um, baby shower and we got her so many things that she needed, diapers, clothes, you name it. And then I was also able to fundraise through my pro-life community on my Instagram, a thousand dollars to help her get set up with anything that she might need for the arrival of her little girl. A couple weeks later, my mom was the one in the delivery room when baby Victoria was born. I think my mom actually cut the umbilical cord and she was there supporting Angie through her labor. And then this is when I met her for the first time, just a couple of weeks after that. And then a few weeks after that, we, or actually this was a couple months, she, um, she's so cute. I babysat her a few times so that Angie could work. Um, she started making empanadas, so I'd go to her house and she'd just cook all day and I'd be there with her baby. Um, and then a few months after that, we were able to get her dad back to the United States and they had a wedding ceremony to celebrate reunifying as a family. <clears throat> And then very shortly after this, baby Victoria was baptized at our church, um, and they have become a big part of our lives. They come over for holidays, and um, it's just such a blessing to get to be a part of their lives uh, and just see the power of the pro-life movement work firsthand. I think a lot of times we think about these circumstances and these people and these arguments and we forget that we're talking about people in our own communities, that there are women, that there are children, that there are fathers that need help and support and they're right here and they need you. And even if you feel 
ill-equipped, even if you're not exactly sure what to do, I promise you there are resources out there. There are ways for you to get involved regardless of your age, your background, even your availability. Maybe you only have one hour a week. That will still make a difference. If every single person who is pro-life did something about it, we would see growth very fast. This all happened because my mom went to pray on a sidewalk for one hour. For one hour. She gave one hour of her time, and this is what the Lord did with that faith, with her willingness to go out there, even though she did not want to. It's an overwhelming and exhausting movement, and yet it is so beautiful. It is so encouraging, and it is so motivating to understand that you can make a real difference. I can tell you firsthand, if you had told me seven years ago that this is what I would be doing with my life, I would probably laugh at you and ask, what is the pro-life movement? Because I didn't realize that there were people gathering together to strategize, to figure out how we can effectively serve women. I thought people were pro-life or they were pro-choice, but oh no, it is so much more than that. And you are a part of it. It is exciting. It is encouraging. And there is nothing more rewarding than knowing that you are making a difference in the lives of those around you. Whether you are a student on your campus, whether you are a community member, whether you are a sibling, an aunt, it doesn't matter. You can make a difference. You can use your voice because I guarantee you, you have something unique to bring to this movement. Maybe you're really good at graphic design and you can work for a pro-life organization to help them effectively target social media to draw people into our movement to educate people through that maybe you have a knack with connecting with people and you can go and serve at a local pregnancy center you can counsel women on on their options you can be there for women who are post-abortive maybe you love holding a bullhorn and screaming pro-life chants into it You can go to rallies and protests and make sure that your voice is heard because culture doesn't want that. Media doesn't want that. They don't want you around. They don't want to see how young, how lively and diverse you are. They want to continue to perpetuate the narrative that we are nothing but a bunch of old white men. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's not the extent of the movement. We have to constantly fight against misinformation, and the best way that we can do that is to show up. They can't redefine who we are if we are constantly in their face showing them who we are. If you remember, a lot of the the responses I got to people who were previously pro-choice, who became pro-life, what was a common theme? I didn't know what pro-lifers were really like. I thought they were this. I didn't understand they were this. And the only way somebody could continue to hold that view is that if we are silent, if we are scared, if we don't use our voice. And I think sometimes we're we're worried about saying the wrong thing. We're worried about offending. We're worried about ruffling feathers. If we are walking forward in this, in truth and love, that is the best thing that we can do to have those conversations, but do it in a way that honors and respects those that we're talking about. To walk the walk, to support the women in our communities that need support, that is what the pro-life movement is. It is not just anti-abortion. We do not just want pre-born babies to live. We want families to thrive. We want women to be supported. We want them to know that they don't have to choose between the life of their child and their hopes and dreams. Women are strong enough to do both. And I am sick and tired of our media trying to convince women that they are weak without abortion. How offensive is that? To say that, well, you you can't have a job and have a family, really? Because women are doing that all across the country and they're doing it phenomenally. The problem is our culture and the abortion industry wants women to feel alone. When women go into Planned Parenthood for an appointment or an abortion, what do they tell them? This is the best thing for you. You know, this would change your life. This would uproot it. 
you wouldn't be able to focus on, on what you really want to do. This baby will ruin your life and ab abortion will solve that problem. The reality is that women are strong enough and as a community, we can be their village. Women shouldn't have to do this completely alone. Women should have support and resources and maybe they don't have that within their own circles and that is where we come in with organizations like Standing With You that make sure that women understand their rights on campuses. There's girls that are getting kicked out of housing and, and getting failed in classes because they don't have childcare. They absolutely need to be advocated for and that is something that you can do. Again, you may not know the effects of your work. Most of the work that we do is unseen. But I promise you, it is rewarding. I promise you that you will know that you are making a difference in those lives because it is always right to stand up for human life. It is always right to defend the innocent and the vulnerable. And so, we need to take this excitement, this momentum. I hope that you have gathered everything that you have learned today in your breakout sessions, the excitement from the march, and I want you to bring that energy back into your own community day in and day out in your fight for life. You have a community, look around you. You are not alone. The media wants you to think that as a pro-life Gen Zer, you're by yourself, you're in the minority. The reality? is you are in the majority. This movement is growing every single day because people are realizing that abortion is objectively wrong, that abortion hurts women, and women deserve better. We will see the end of abortion. We may not know the day or the time, but life will always triumph over death. And so hold on to that. Use that as a motivation as you continue to use your voice to figure out where you fit in this movement and to speak up for those who have no voice. Somebody needs you to fight for them today. Because where there's life, there is always hope. Thank you.